I'd like to begin by uh, thanking the organizers, uh, thanking the uh, Bulgarian Academy of Sciences and the National Science Foundation of the United States for organizing this very interesting meeting, bringing us together, really, as, uh, as we were told at the uh, beginning of this uh, workshop by, uh, by Dimitar, in a transdisciplinary way. Uh, today, I'm going to provide you an overview, I think, and then some open questions about observational constraints on early Earth geodynamics. And what does this mean? Because there's a lot of jargon involved when discussing uh, geological phenomena. So I'm going to try my best to define for you what uh, this means and hopefully what it means for you in your own research. Um, I am uh, Stephen Moisish, that's me here, and I'm at uh, Budapest, uh, which is a, a neighbor of um, Bulgaria, not very far from here. And um, what I'm going to present today is uh, made possible by outstanding collaborators. This is, this is not even a complete list, and some of the people are here. Uh, Ira Gözen, I'm extremely excited to see her presentation on encapsulation. And uh, I've worked with uh, John Sutherland and Dougal Ritson on some aspects of uh, early phosphate chemistry. But in particular, uh, you'll see a lot of collaborative work with Ramon Brasser, who is with us in Budapest, Maria Lugaro, also there, and my colleagues Kevin Hung in Bern, who's now in Munich, Fabrice Gaillard, and Oleg Abramov, Stephanie Werner, and others. So thanks to them, I can build a more coherent story for you. And what is the nature of that story? Well, it's to try to understand this. In one of my comments, I said, Geology is the quintessential science of circumstantial evidence, which means we are forced to use data and then to try to model it to understand it, rather than much the other way around. And, and thankfully, we have solid materials to work with. Now, working on the Earth, of course, we have the added benefit. We can use spacecraft called Toyota Land Cruisers or Lufthansa, to bring us to places and collect samples. And if it's something interesting, we have the added benefit of being able to go back. Now, some of which you will uh, see today was recently uh, published in this paper. And just email me if you'd like to have a copy of it. But it kind of assembles these thoughts of what is emerging as a new science, much like geology and physics got together to give us geophysics and therefore plate tectonics theory. Geology and chemistry got together to give us geochemistry and such things as the age of the Earth. Geology and biology got together and is giving us a vibrant field called geobiology, the interface of the biosphere with the geosphere. Now it is time that geology and astronomy unite in their efforts to understand planets around other stars that are more than just balls of rock, metal, and fluids. So I invite you to have a look at that paper. But meanwhile, recall, planets form hot. They form hot as a consequence of their accretion, building blocks coming together so that uh, kinetic energy is transformed into thermal energy at impact. We heard about this yesterday. We heard about this this morning. Impacts are important in the early Earth. However, they're only important if you know the process and you have evidence for it that allows you to model. So the overview of my talk is I'm going to discuss geological field evidence as the only direct way to test the, some of the models that we have heard already at this meeting. What theoretically was the first crust? And then what happened to it? Do we know something about the timing and its destruction mechanism and the transformations that took place? And what traces are there of its primary or prior existence? Now, I mentioned jargon, so I'm going to try to uh, overcome this problem in geochemistry and geophysics so I can reach especially the early career scientists here. Because there's a lot of low-hanging fruit 
and uh, there's a lot to be done, obviously. I am going to start off reminding you that planets like the Earth form hot. It's an expectation that melting of a planet like the Earth in colossal impacts, such as moon size or Mars size, make a primordial crust, which was what we call mafic or ultramafic. That means it's very rich in iron and magnesium. Iron and magnesium rich minerals are refractory. They have very high melting temperatures. So if you're melting everything, the first thing to crystallize out is the most refractory material. This is like a flotation crust almost in a lava lake, as you might see in Hawaii at Pu'ol in this case. The crust ought to have formed during and after initial cooling of the planet. When you have giant impacts, you make magma oceans. Magma oceans are the consequence of dumping all of those jewels into the target. And evidence comes uh, from systematics in short and long-lived radioisotopic systems, which I'll dwell on at the end of the talk. But there are others, like uranium lead and so forth, that show evidence for substantial early differentiation, meaning that the molten earth separated, kind of like milk into cream and skim milk. And that is because of mechanical and chemical differences between different minerals. It's why you have crust to stand on. And indications arise from recent work uh, at the timing of all of this. A global magma ocean formed. It formed when you make the moon. The moon was perhaps Earth's worst day ever. Uh, it is an impact that was enough to vaporize the planet. This is from my colleague Robin Knup. There are many other uh, simulations. They're all equally spectacular. But the numbers that you need to remember here are that the moon forming impact supplied about 7 million joules per kilogram to the Earth. That is very similar to the low pressure heat of vaporization of rock. Latest estimates place this at about 35 or so million years after the first solids formed around the sun. So it's an early event, and we'd like to learn more about it because Earth would have plotted on the Hertzsprung-Russell diagram for a short time. This is the diagram, of course, of temperature of stars, and here's luminosity. Earth would have plotted right here for about 2,000 years next to where Proxima Centauri is now. But this cooling effectively radiates back to space and then uh, precipitates a rock vapor atmosphere. We know what the first rock ought to have been, because if you take something of Earth mantle composition, which is what this is, this is a phase diagram. So pressure in gigapascals transformed to depth in kilometers. Here's 400 kilometers here. This is temperature here going down, and this is in Celsius rather than Kelvin. Once you get from here, which is where we plotted on the HR diagram, to over here, you hit the, the solidus for olivine plus pyroxene plus liquid. These are common minerals formed with our, which are very rich in magnesium, iron, and their silicates. So the first crust would be like this, which is called comadiite, a rock that is very rare these days. But if you look at the early geological history of our planet, it's quite commonplace. It has a melting temperature that's something like 200 degrees higher than our mantle is capable of achieving now, which is an example of secular cooling of the Earth. So then what happened? Well, the Earth, Moon, Mars are not good archives of late accretion, of impact bombardment. And the reason for that is that Earth Mars, and even the Moon to some degree, are dynamic systems where the crust gets recycled and remelted. We have to go further. We have to go to the asteroid belt to understand the nature of accretion 
of material that's coming in and continuing to strike the planets. The asteroids are an archive of late accretion. We have 60,000 samples of these things in the world's collection. They come from 130 or so parent bodies. We only know about four of them for sure. But the asteroids are fascinating because they predate the planets. So anything that happened to the planets happened to them, and it, the information stays with the asteroids and is erased on the planets. We've analyzed the ages of uh, different classes of asteroidal meteorites, from Vesta, from primitive uh, achondrite and stony meteorites that look like rocks, iron meteorites, and to tichondrites, which we think are dominantly the building blocks of the Earth, ordinary chondrites, dominantly the building blocks of Mars, and so forth. And these are ages versus the temperature at which the ages reset. This is called closure. So when the system is open, when it's hot, you let it cool, information is retained in different minerals and different isotopic systems at different temperatures. I think you all see that there's this waterfall type pattern here. We make sense of this as the onset of giant planet migration at 4.48 billion years ago, here. That's the only mechanism that is powerful enough to kick up the velocities in the asteroid belt, create the thermal conditions to reset ages in things that are two and a half times farther away from the sun than we are. Using these data, we can model it. And so we've done this with uh, Ramon Brasser and Stephanie Werner, published a couple of years ago in Icarus, where this is Mercury, Venus, Earth, Mars, Jupiter, Saturn, Uranus, and Neptune. They're in close configuration. And they scatter the leftovers of planet formation. This is modeling late accretion. So we know the time scale, we know the masses, and then we try to uh, reconcile it with a model. And that's what this is. This is a cumulative crater frequency, but you can think of it as flux. High here, low here, and this is time. These are various old uh, ideas about how the flux change with like a late heavy bombardment or a smooth exponential decline. But late accretion here of the inner solar system has to account for the total masses, has to account for the crater statistics, and has to account for the ultimate end product geochemistry of the planets. That's what this is, this red line. So now we have a production function for what has happened to the Earth ever since the moon forming event. Well, that's cool. Now what? Well, a lot of people have uh, got interested in how giant impacts have done things like make evolved crust on the early Earth, and origin of continents, and impact-driven subduction, and so on. It's a hot topic, pun intended. But why don't we look for evidence of this? That's where I'm going to use this mineral called zircon. Many of you have heard of it. Many of you have not. Zircon is this mineral here. It has a crystal structure like this, a tightly compacted zirconium orthosilicate structure. This thing is dense. It's better than diamond. Zircon is forever. Diamond you could burn in a blast furnace. Not zircon. It won't, it won't even melt at 1,000 degrees. And it also has lots of information contained within. It's very information rich, and it's very retentive. When a zircon crystallizes, it's darn difficult to get rid of it. It can be recycled through the mantle. In fact, diffusion of information like elements of like oxygen and rare earth elements, uranium, lead, thorium that we use for age determinations, is unimaginably slow. So, we know for zircon and another mineral called apatite, which has a lower closure temperature, 450 degrees, this is calcium phosphate, we can model the closure temperatures under different diffusional length scales at different temperatures. Here's one second, an hour, a day, a year, a million years, and so forth. 
Now we have the tools to do this. We have the mass production function. We have a record in the crust. Let's try to model it. The thermal consequences of bombardment using existing mass production functions are shown here. This is unpublished work. Uh, it's uh, about to be submitted. But I show here the percent of crust that's molten here over time based on that production that I showed you. At any particular point of time, the maximum amount of crust here that is melted is about 60%, and then it declines rapidly. And that's because of the demise of comets, sweeping up of leftover planetesimals. The rest is just eking out bombardment from what's left from the asteroid belt. You can try to kill them all, and you still can't do it. This is if we started off with a magma ocean type condition, and you see that uh, everything is 100% molten at the origin here, but very, very quickly cools. So you have conditions where prebiotic chemistry, like what we saw this morning, can take place. Now we'll hear more about bombardment in the next talk by Tim Lichtenberg, and of course of small body interaction in the talk uh, at the end of the session by Rosita Kokotaniekova. I hope I said that right. It's easier than Hungarian. <laughs> now, this is what we get if we had zircons scattered through the crust and reset them in this bombardment scenario. So I'm using them as temperature pressure meters. So this is all model-based, and it depends on if you've got a high accretion rate or a low accretion rate. And you see the different uh, high and low means that there's a shift in the peak here of peak bombardment. This is work from yesterday. Uh, we use some new stuff uh, at uh, 0.57 weight percent of a very steep early uh, accretion event showing lots and lots and lots of impacts at about 4.3 billion years ago. Well, all of that's nice, pun intended. I brought a nice with me. It's right over there on that table. It's the Acasta nice. It's 4 billion years old. That rock has been around the center of the galaxy 18 times. So go, lift, pick, pick it up, lift it, touch it, and so on. But what I'm about to show you is that the significance of direct rock samples tell us specific conditions about origin of life on a planet like the Earth. And the significance of these samples is that they're direct samples of the Hadean Eorachean world, but they're separated from everything else by shear zones. A shear zone is this. It's basically you take a rock, muck it up, and then roll it like this. It's what would happen to you if you were in the crust for four billion years. Now, there are frozen moments in time of a dynamic Earth. Every rock you pick up just records the last thing that happened to it. So what happened to the zircons? Now, there are places like here in, in Western Australia, the Jack Hills, which I've worked at. And here, this is a new place that I'm very grateful to uh, Nadia Drabon, a new assistant professor at Harvard, who has worked here, a new Hadean zircon locality in South Africa in the Barberton Greenstone Belt. Here are the zircon reset age spectra for different weight percents of late accretion coming in. So we would expect that zircon production from and destruction from impacts would be here. But here is the actual age spectrum of measured Hadean zircons from the Earth. Well, that's peculiar. Look, when that goes down, that goes up. And then I got really curious and I looked at titanium temperatures because zircons are also thermometers. And so this is a bit messy, I'm sorry. But this is temperature here, so the higher you are, that's the higher temperature. So it looks like cool temperatures prevail down here, and then you get to sort of 800 degrees, which is where you crystallize rocks like the one that's back there. Well, that's interesting. 
because this looks nothing like production from impacts. Well, that's telling me to watch my time. And instead, it looks like crust production on the Earth. This is from Jun Kurnaga. Kurnaga shows from our data on uh, Neodymium isotopes, you had something like 5 to 10% of present continental area on the Hadean Earth. Doesn't sound like much. That's the area of Australia. And if you chopped it up 20 times and scattered it over the surface, that's plenty of opportunity for dry land. So since time is short, I'm going to go down now to this last part. And I'm going to say, where did this crust go? And we can trace the Earth chemically, thankfully, because we have isotopes. Now, isotopes aren't good just for heating, right? But they can also give you ages and process. And there's one particular one. It's the samarium neodymium system. Samarium is a rare earth element. And it has an isotope that's extinct, 146 samarium. It has a half-life of about 68 million years. It decays to neodymium-142. Well, the cool thing is that samarium here likes to stay in the Earth's mantle. Here's the core mantle and crust. Earth is like a giant avocado, actually. Uh, similar uh, ratios of, of seed to mantle. Well, if you're over here, if you're taking from the mantle, you have high samarium to neodymium ratio, because samarium likes to stay in the mantle here, and neodymium likes to go in the crust. Here in the crust, it's the opposite. The crust has low samarium, but high neodymium. So it means that the decay here of this extinct nuclide takes the earth and it separates it, what was previously together. So positive stays in the mantle, negative goes into the crust. Because it's extinct, you're not making any more changes to this ratio. So to get rid of it, you have to put it together. So you have to mix it together. So that's what the story is. The story from the Acasta rocks, like the one over there, it's four billion years old, shows crustal, low, negative anomaly here. And it shows that that was formed about 4.4 billion years ago. Other rocks from Western Greenland and Northern Canada that I've worked on, from the Issa supercrustal belt and the Nuvuakitut supercrustal belt, these things are about 3.9 billion years old. They have both positive, which is mantle derived, and negative, which is crustal derived. And they show separation here. Everything should be the same. Everything should plot in this little box. But in this early day, we see the separation, the formation of the crust. Well, I think you can see positive on one side, negative on the other side. You put them together, there's a trend in age. You're, you've unmixed them, and then now you're mixing the two reservoirs together in recycling the crust. This resembles the cooling curve of Earth's mantle here, which is cooled with time. Earth is doing this. So that rock that you're going to pick up is like mixing paint colors together. And for us to understand it, we have to separate each of these different colors from one another, get the timing, and get the process. So to conclude, Earth's oldest verifiable rocks are a little bit over 4 billion. There's nothing older. I wonder if late accretion destroyed it or its active crustal processes. A primordial crust was this very magnesium iron rich one. But it was remade into something like continental crust rapidly, because Earth loses heat and it recycles this crust rapidly. These are the most commonly available substrates for chemistry leading to life's origin. The oldest sediments show circumstantial evidence of a dynamic in the Hadean 
uh, eon, including beach sands that we heard about this morning, but emergent land was present and we're seeing evidence of it. Thick, buoyant felsic crust, like continents, existed throughout this eon. Dry land is a natural consequence of planetary cooling. Every volcanic edifice that you saw is there because the planet has to lose heat. The primordial crust was destroyed, and this means the record can be confusing if you try to measure everything, you just get an average. Late accretion had a strong potential to modulate the crust, but it was a risk versus reward scenario for early life, and any prebiotic chemistry must account for these observations. I want to thank you with a picture of what I think the early Earth looked like, and also thanks to the early career scientists. I look forward to discussions and further uh, education during this interesting meeting. Thank you. Thank you, Steve, for a very nice talk. Um, I have a naive question, and probably just an absolutely crazy hypothetical, but I was kind of curious about it. If you happen to form a planet out of the material that Earth is made out of, the same size and everything else, but somehow happen to avoid differentiation, what would it look like? How would you do that? Uh, oh, I, I, I don't think you could. I'm just curious, what would the differences be? Would that tell you anything important about what differentiation has accomplished? So, so there are a couple of ways to account for differentiation. Differentiation means that you're separating everything mechanically and chemically into a core, mantle, and crust, right? Metals in core, silicates in mantle, flotation material in the crust, and then atmophile elements, right? You do this during accretion, so heterogeneous accretion, because things are slamming in at 18 to 40 kilometers per second and building up uh, larger objects. Most of the mass comes in from a, a accumulation or agglomeration of larger objects. And then there's radioactive heating. But let's say that happened late when a lot of the early radioactivities, like aluminum-26, already went extinct. Then differentiation becomes incomplete or inefficient. So the degree of differentiation is, in some ways, a function of the time at which the planet forms. I'll give you an example. Let's imagine we had a super Ganymede there's nothing physically impossible about making a planet that's like the mass of the Earth, but it's 50% ice and rock. That would be if it formed late by cold accretion at low velocities in the outer solar system, it would maybe partially differentiate. So what's really missing here for planetary science is that unlike Astronomy, which has an HR diagram for stars, there is no HR diagram for planets. We're still trying to figure out what kind of diversity is actually out there. Thank you for the question. Thanks. Thank you, Stephen, for the excellent talk. Uh, ben Pierce, JHU. I know you've done a lot of uh, excellent work with zircons, and in our field, there's been numerous studies which have helped uncover some more stories about the Hadean Earth, uh, Dustin Trail et al, for instance. Yes, well. my former student. <laughs> Very proud of <laughs> him. Mm -hmm. uh, and I'm wondering now if there's anything more that can be learned from uh, isotopic analysis of zircons, or if we've really uncovered all we can about the Hadean. Do you like the onion? It's that paragon of journalistic excellence. There was a cover story of The Onion once that says, geologists say we shall soon run out of rocks. People like me, who spent more than a quarter century looking for old rocks, have run into a wall. There's nothing older on the Earth that's a rock than four billion years, than that thing that's lying on the table. So we have to go elsewhere. We have to go to the moon. We have to go to Mars. 
Did you know they're Martian zircons? We've analyzed them. Martian zircons also have a record of the oxygen fugacity of the Martian mantle. Here's the Earth's mantle oxygen fugacity evolution from Dustin's work and uh, work of, um, of Jesse Reimink and us and so on. It plots up here where CO2 and N2 and so on are expected to be degassed. Mars, on the other hand, is down over here. Iron Vistae around zero plus or minus one. Hydrogen ought to come out there and CO and other things. So now we have to extend these kinds of studies to extraterrestrial materials. And yeah, there's still uh, a great deal to be learned. Nature has a lot to tell us here. Okay, thanks very much, Steve. Thank you. Is Tim here? So um, next up is Tim uh, Lippenberg, who um, comes to us from the Netherlands.